Well, good morning and welcome to Spring Convocation. As we begin our time of worship, may I ask that you would listen to these words from Psalm 10. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and he is the eternal king. He made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, and spread out the heavens by his understanding. As we gather, we worship the one true and living King, Jesus Christ, to the glory of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. May I invite you to stand together as we sing our processional hymn this morning, O Worship the King. singing. You may be seated. Well, good morning. We welcome you to this special service of opening convocation as we commence uh, today, the spring 2020 semester here at the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Scarborough College. We are so thankful for all of you who have gathered together this morning here in the McGorman Chapel, and we welcome all who are joining us online this morning at swibbits.live. This is a special day. It's marked by the fact that you see the faculty properly robed in their uh, regalia, where we have a, an additional bit of uh, ceremony uh, as we come together for not only the first time this calendar year of our Lord 2020 for a service of Christian worship here at McGorman Chapel, but also as this is a special day as we have several introductions and recognitions we want to make of those who have uh, joined us, of those who are newly elected to the faculty, and uh, other matters as well. Let me first of all recognize 
a newly appointed faculty member who has joined us beginning with the spring 2020 semester here at Southwestern Seminary, Dr. Chris Osborne. Dr. Osborne, would you stand? Dr. Osborne has been appointed professor of preaching and pastoral ministry in the School of Preaching. He completed his Bachelor of Arts degree in English at Mississippi College, his MDiv and PhD in preaching degrees from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He will complete his service this month at the Central Baptist Church in the Bryan College Station, Texas area, having served that same congregation as pastor since 1986. He has served our Convention of Churches in various roles throughout his career, including various committees of the Southern Baptist Convention and a term as President of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. He is married to Peggy, and they have two children, Stephen and uh, Laura. In fact, we have already pressed Dr. Osborne into service. He taught a doctoral seminar last week, and uh, feedback was uh, so strong it made its way even to the President's office of this new uh, professor. You would be at a loss. If you make it through your Southwestern Seminary career and you do not take a course from Dr. Chris Osborne in preaching and pastoral ministry, he exemplifies the heart of who we are at Southwestern Seminary of scholar practitioners. By the way, he just earned his PhD degree in December while completing 30 plus years of pastoral ministry. So be encouraged. It is never too late to continue in lifelong learning and to earn your doctoral degree from Southwestern Seminary. Would you welcome Dr. Osborne to our faculty? This is also a special time because it is in formal convocation when we recognize those faculty that have been newly elected by the Board of Trustees to the faculty of Southwestern Seminary and Scarborough College. Uh, Full-time faculty service here at Southwestern Seminary is divided into two categories. There are uh, those who serve by virtue of presidential appointment and those who are elected by our Board of Trustees. Uh, election by the Board of Trustees is our institution's way of saying uh, we want you to be here, and we want you to be here for the long term. And that is marked in formal convocation with the signing of our book of confessional heritage, which we're going to do in just a moment. Th this is a uh, southwestern tradition uh, that in formal convocation, newly elected faculty publicly sign this book. Now, this book is not significant in and of itself, but what it testifies to and represents is of extraordinary significance. Since our chartering as a seminary on March 14th, 1908, every faculty member, be he or she appointed, elected, adjunct, instructor, whatever the status may be, has signed the Articles of Faith of Southwestern Seminary, beginning with the New Hampshire Confession in 1908, and since 1925, every iteration of the Baptist faith and message. We are a confessional seminary. Every faculty member here has indicated his or her full agreement with everything contained in our statement of faith. We are a pre-committed seminary, uh, and we are in trust, held in trust, not just in terms of having our governing board elected by the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention in annual session, but the fact that the doctrinal statement that has been adopted by our convention of churches is the exact same doctrinal statement of our seminary. We are in lockstep solidarity, standing precisely where our convention of churches has said, we will stand. And so you can have confidence that our seminary is committed to upholding the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints, the truths that we confess. And so this ceremony is done not in the privacy of the president's office, not, not, not with faculty who are uh, holding their fingers behind their back, uh, kind of winking and nodding, saying, well, I'll sign that piece of paper, but I don't have to live or abide by it. But publicly, there is the integrity of witness before the gathered community, before a watching world, that the elected faculty of Southwestern Seminary gladly proudly, happily, enthusiastically say, I put my signature, my pen, my name publicly to the truths that we confess as a seminary community. This is not the first time they've signed this book. They've signed the doctrinal statement before, but this is the time where it is made more public and more permanent. And so this morning, we have a number of newly elected faculty who will be signing the book of confessional heritage 
And as I call your name, I would like for you to make your way to the stage, or in the case of our first signee, to make his way from where he is currently on the stage to the signing desk. Dr. Joseph Kreider has been elected by the Board of Trustees to be Dean of the School of Church Music and Worship and Professor of Church Music and Worship. Dr. Kreider completed his bachelor's degree and master's degree in performance at Bowling Green State University and the Doctor of Arts degree in performance and pedagogy at the University of Northern Colorado. Prior to his coming to Southwestern Seminary, Dr. Kreider taught and was the executive director of the Institute for Biblical Worship at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, also taught at Liberty University, Southwest Baptist University, and Westmont College. He has also served as worship pastor of churches in five different states. Dr. Kreider is married to Amy, who is with us this morning, and they have four children, Juliana, Katrina, Cole, and Amelia. Dr. Kreider, it is my great joy and privilege to invite you this morning to add your name to the Southwestern Seminary Book of Confessional Heritage at this time. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Michael Wilder has been elected Dean of the Jack D. Terry Jr. School of Educational Ministries and Professor of Educational Ministries here at Southwestern Seminary. Dr. Wilder completed his Bachelor of Business Administration and Management degree at Clayton State University, the MDiv at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and the PhD in Christian Education and Leadership from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He previously served as the J.M. Frost Associate Professor of Leadership and Discipleship and Associate Vice President for Doctoral Studies at Southern Seminary. He also served as the lead pastor of the First Southern Baptist Church in Floyd's Knobs, Indiana. In addition to these roles, Dr. Wilder has served in a variety of other roles in both the academy and the church. He is married to Ginger, who is here with us this morning, and they have three children, Daly, Ashton, and Mackenzie. Dr. Wilder, it gives me great joy to now invite you to add your name to the Southwestern Seminary Book of Confessional Heritage. Amen. Dr. David S. Dockery has been elected Distinguished Professor of Theology in the School of Theology. In addition, he serves as theologian in residence at the B.H. Carroll Center for Baptist Heritage and Mission and as special consultant to the president. Dr. Dockery completed his bachelor's degree at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, the Master of Divinity at Grace Theological Seminary, the Master of Divinity at Southwestern Seminary, the Master of Arts and New Testament at Texas Christian University, and the Doctor of Philosophy and Humanities at the University of Texas System. Dr. Dockery served as president of Union University in Jackson, Tennessee for 18 years, and before coming to Southwestern, he served as president and then chancellor of Trinity International University in Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Dr. Dockery is a prolific writer, having authored or edited more than 35 volumes, contributed to more than 70 other books. He has served on many boards and has served faithfully in a number of denominational service roles. He is married to Lenice, and they have three children, Jonathan, Benjamin, and Timothy. And Dr. Dockery gives me great joy and pleasure to invite you to now add your name to the Southwestern Seminary Book of Confessional Heritage. Dr. Gregory A. Wills has been elected Research Professor of Church History and Baptist Heritage in the School of Theology. In addition to his faculty role, Dr. Wills has been appointed as the founding director of the B.H. Carroll Center for Baptist Heritage and Mission. Dr. Wills completed his Bachelor of Science degree and his Master of Theology degree at Duke University, his Master of Divinity degree at the Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and his Doctor of Philosophy in Religion at Emory University. From, from 1994 to 2019, he served in a number of roles at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, including a term as Dean of the School of Theology there. Dr. Wills is a prolific writer and is currently writing a history of the Southern Baptist Convention for B&H Academic. He is married to Kathy, who is here with us this morning, and they have four children, Samuel, Abigail, James, and Magdalene. 
Dr. Wills, it gives me great joy to invite you now to affix your name to the Southwestern Seminary Book of Confessional Heritage. Dr. Chuck Lewis has been elected professor of church music and worship in the School of Church Music and Worship. He has also been appointed as associate dean of the School of Church Music and Worship. Dr. Lewis completed his Bachelor of Music Education at the University of South Carolina and the Master of Music Education at the Florida State University. The Master of Music in Church Music Ministry here at Southwestern Seminary and the PhD in Christian Worship at Southern Seminary. Dr. Lewis previously served as associate professor of church music and worship at Southern Seminary. He has served in a variety of roles in the local church, both before, during, and currently in his academic career. Dr. Lewis, it gives me great joy and pleasure to now invite you to affix your name to the Southwestern Seminary Book of Confessional Heritage. Dr. Travis S. Kearns has been elected Associate Professor of Apologetics and World Religions in the Roy J. Fish School of Evangelism and Missions. Dr. Kearns completed his bachelor's degree in religion at North Greenville University, the Master of Divinity and Doctor of Philosophy at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Kearns has served in the local church as a pastor in the academy as a, an assistant professor of Christian worldview and apologetics at Boyce College and as a church planter and pastor. In addition, Dr. Kern served as the SEND North American City Missionary in Utah and as a revitalization specialist with the North American Mission Board. Dr. Kearns is married to Stacy, and they have one child, Jeremiah. Dr. Kearns, it gives me great joy to invite you now to affix your signature to the Southwestern Seminary Book of Confessional Heritage. There is one other uh, elected faculty member that I want to recognize at, uh, at this time, but I am not inviting him to sign the Book of Confessional Heritage because he has already signed the Book of Confessional Heritage. Truly, he was not merely elected, he was re-elected to the faculty of Southwestern Seminary, and that is Dr. Chris Shirley. Would you stand, Dr. Shirley? Dr. Chris Shirley, amen. He signed in the fall of 2007, but he has been re-elected to the faculty of Southwestern Seminary, this time as professor of educational ministries in the Jack D. Terry Jr. School of Educational Ministries. He has also been appointed as associate dean of the Terry School. He completed his Bachelor of Business Administration degree at Belmont University, the Master of Arts in Religious Education, and the Doctor of Philosophy in Christian Education here at Southwestern Seminary. He served here from 2007 to 2016, after which time he served for the last three years as program director for the MA in Discipleship and Associate Professor of Discipleship at Dallas Baptist University. He has also served the local church in a number of ministerial roles. He is married to Isabel, and they have two children, Andrew and Haley. Dr. Shirley, it is a delight to recognize your re-election to the faculty and to welcome you back home to the Dome here at Southwestern Seminary. Amen. This is a service of Christian worship. And uh, even as we recognize our newly elected faculty, the one we worship is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is from him that uh, we are able to speak. And so we need him to speak to us. And so let me invite you, if you would, to stand with me now as Dr. Kreider comes to lead us in this hymn of preparation, Speak, O Lord. in 
that we live. Speak, O Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Let me invite you, if you have a copy of God's Word this morning, to turn or to scroll over to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 15. Jeremiah, chapter 15. And it is good to be back together. It's good to see uh, each other, many of us, for the first time in this calendar year 2020, on this first day of classes. Uh, I have uh, looked forward to the beginning of my first full calendar year as uh, your president and have looked forward to the beginning of the uh, spring uh, semester. I know that for some of you, you're thinking, you know, spring really hasn't uh, sprung yet. Uh, I can assure you, where I used to live, it's in the 20s. So... Uh, this is a, a glorious providence of the Lord to be in uh, this kind uh, of, of weather. You know, I, I often say we are living in very interesting times, and that may be an understatement. Uh, we're living in very interesting times, uh, not only here at Southwestern Seminary, just where we find ourselves now, but we're living in very interesting times in, um, in the broader culture, uh, particularly in our Southern Baptist Convention of Churches. And, um, you know, we are not an independent seminary. Uh, we are uh, an entity, an institution of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. Uh, we do not stand in isolation from other entities, other uh, seminaries. But, of course, there is a uh, distinct role and mission and vision that I believe God has always given to Southwestern Seminary since March 14th, 1908. And uh, part of that has been uh, to speak into the life of issues and to speak with the kind of uh, what I pray is uh, uh, convictional uh, words, but also words that are uh, constructive in terms of where we find ourselves. Um, I don't know about you, but a lot of what I see happening uh, around us uh, grieves me. And particularly what I see happening in a lot of cases on, uh, on social media 
and, uh, and the like. It, it, these are very troubling times. And particularly for those of you who are, are new to Southwestern Seminary, we in the fall will recognize officially all who have joined us with a formal pronouncement of uh, you as new uh, Southwesterners. But for those of you who are beginning your studies uh, here at Southwestern Seminary in Scarborough College, uh, you could not have picked a better place to be, in my opinion. But you also uh, have picked a, a very interesting time in kind of God's economy to be engaging in Christian ministry and mission. Uh, when I sat in, uh, in these, well, it wasn't these chairs because this building wasn't built, but in Truett, uh, when I was a student here, uh, I often thought that uh, the greatest uh, challenges and battles and obstacles that I would have to face would be from out there. But I've had to learn that's just not always the case. The word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, beginning in verse 15. Let me invite you, if you would, to stand with me. We might honor the reading of the word of God together this morning. And let me just encourage you to follow along in your hearts as I share this word from God's word. The Bible says, you know, Lord, remember me and take note of me. Avenge me against my persecutors. In your patience, don't take me away. Know that I suffered disgrace for your honor. Your words were found and I ate them. Your words became a delight to me and the joy of my heart. For I bear your name, Lord God of armies. I never sat with the band of revelers and I did not celebrate with them. Because your hand was on me, I sat alone. For you filled me with indignation. Why has my pain become unending, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? You truly have become like a mirage to me, water that is not reliable. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you return, I will take you back. You will stand in my presence. And if you speak noble words rather than worthless ones, you will be my spokesman. It is they who must return to you. You must not return to them. Then I will make you a fortified wall of bronze to this people. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to save you and rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will rescue you from the power of evil people and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of our Lord. And thanks be to God this morning. Please be seated and may God richly bless the reading and study of his word together this morning. If you know anything about uh, uh, the prophet Jeremiah... Uh, you know, of course, that he was uh, a very unique uh, man of God, given a very unique uh, assignment. He was called by God. God uh, had uh, destined him for a prophetic ministry. But, but I'm not sure that it's the kind of prophetic ministry, Dr. Allen, that most of us would choose in the preaching ministry because you go back to places like uh, Jeremiah 7, and uh, uh, God says to Jeremiah, when you speak all these prophetic utterances to them, they will not listen to you. When you call to them, they will not answer you. Now, I mean, could you imagine the kind of encouragement you get in a preaching class here? Hey, you need to go out and preach the word in the church, but nobody's going to listen to you. They're not going to like it, right? We don't set out intentionally to say things, hopefully, that we think people are not going to want to hear, especially those who name the name of Christ. And as I mentioned, it can be very easy for us if we are early in our ministerial trajectory to think, that the greatest challenges we're going to face are going to be from fighting all the devil's crowd out there. And heaven knows there is all kind of compromise and capitulation and frankly just crazy out there in terms of what we're having to navigate in the broader culture today. It, it is not the Bible Belt anymore. It is not a culture that is going to be affirming and encouraging to you in general in terms of following a vocational ministry trajectory. But sometimes I think we fail to remember that the greatest challenge we often face is not from fighting the devil's crowd out there, but from fighting a work of the devil amongst and within those who name the name of Christ. In the church, in our convention of churches. You know, you live long enough and um, you're going to get fan mail. And uh, maybe it's just because of the position that I now hold, but, but I, I, I got a little piece of fan mail recently. In fact, it's dated on the date of my wife's birthday, January 14th. 
And um, I, it's a five-page letter. I won't read all of it, but let me just share with you some encouraging words. Uh, quote, uh, your actions have the appearance of a medieval despot that as was the practice conquered a kingdom and killed all the previous despot staff for fear they would cause him problems. It is that portrayed by the current dictator of North Korea who has systematically killed staff and even family members because he was terrified of them. What are you afraid of? And then it ends, in my opinion, the best days of Swibitz are in its past and its future is destined for decline. The premier evangelical seminary in the world will soon become another small cloister of students and faculty echoing in empty halls. Now, if this were written by the uh, president of the uh, Fort Worth Atheist Club or the, uh, the, the Tarrant County Freethinkers or the, uh, you know, the Texas uh, Society for Everything that is anti, you know, God, I'd go, well, you know, being called the dictator of North Korea, you know, that's kind of par for the course. But, um, but this person, uh, you know, makes clear that uh, he, he professes to be a, um, a fellow believer and even a fellow Southern Baptist. And my guess is many of you have uh, received similar kind of fan mail along the way. And it's one of those things of where I'm reminded at times, tragically, the enemy loves to use those who are fellow believers, other Christians, other churches, other institutions to do his bidding. Oh, they may not always, you know, send you a piece of fan mail, but it could be that drive-by tweet, could be that cryptic tweet, subtweet, you know, we're not exactly saying what we really think, but we're kind of throwing it out there to try to, you know, throw shade over somebody else. Or we're going to find ways to continue to fight and to separate and to divide over non-essential matters. We're going to continue to find ways to fight. If, if, if you've got a, a, a nature where you're always trying to find a fight, guess what? You're always going to find one. It will. It, it, it will. You will always have something that you can find to fight about. And one of the great travesties within our tribe is we've become really, really good at fighting and really, really good at warfare and really, really good at tearing down. But we have not figured out a way to actually win the peace and to do that which is constructive rather than destructive. And at times, it can be frankly very discouraging doing ministry in an environment where you've got folks out there who are always looking to send sniper fire your way. That's why I'm drawn to this passage in Jeremiah. Because we get something from Jeremiah that is remarkably raw. <laughs> it's, it's remarkably authentic. It's remarkably real. Jeremiah has been proclaiming the Lord's message, finding unreceptivity, finding criticism, finding rejection from those who claim to be the Lord's own people, those who are attracted more to false prophets in their midst than to the man of God who is preaching the truth. And we get this expression of honesty where he's calling for vengeance against my persecutors. It wasn't just the persecutors in the pagan population. It was the persecutors even within what was claimed to be the household of faith within the nation. Know that I suffer disgrace for your honor. I bear your name. And he makes clear, I, I didn't sit in with a band of revelers. I didn't celebrate with them. Because your hand was on me, I sat alone. Realize one of the greatest realities of ministry is if you are going to follow the Lord in total obedience, total surrender, and with total integrity, it will mean at times you will stand alone. You will sit alone. There will always be those who will say, I'm right behind you, brother. And then you turn around and they're way behind you. So far behind you, you can't even see them. People can talk a good game when it's easy, when there's no cost to be paid, to do what's right. 
to say things that need to be said, to call out things that are things we oftentimes want to hide or to conceal rather than to reveal. And we get this incredible expression here in verse 18, why has my pain become unending and my wound incurable, refusing to be healed, even to the point of where he says, you truly have become like a mirage to me, water that is not reliable. God, where are you? God, where are you when it hurts? Where are you when it hurts when I'm doing your work? Where are you when it hurts when I'm preaching your word? Where are you when it hurts when I'm here and the people who I thought should be receiving and embracing me are rejecting me and ridiculing me? Where are you, God? One of the greatest encouragements that we find when we read the pages of Scripture is we find those who've gone before us who have walked a path we will walk inevitably, who have suffered in ways that we can't fully appreciate or imagine. You know, you don't know what another brother or another sister is going through, really. Because every time we see one another, how are you doing? Fine. Great. Everything's okay. Do we ever go up to somebody and they say, how are you doing? Worse. No, because we, we kind of have this veneer, we kind of have this, this uh, exterior, this impression, we've got to keep up this image we've got to maintain. And, and, and what I appreciate so much about Jeremiah is he is so raw and authentic before God of saying, I'm hurting. And much of my hurt actually is coming from doing your work, from, from following your plan. What happened to my best life now? What, what happened to everything is going to be great and easy? We weren't promised that. In fact, God was remarkably kind to Jeremiah letting him know, hey, this, this is the mission I've given to you, and your requirement is faithfulness, even when there is going to be rejection, ridicule, opposition. Still doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. None of us set out to not be liked in life. None of us set out to find ways to encourage uh, people to, to not be our friends, hopefully, unless you're really unique in personality type. There is going to be pain and suffering when you are fully surrendered to God's plan for your life. There just is. And it's not just gonna be from those who are opposed to God's agenda in terms of the broader culture, there's gonna be pain and suffering even from within those who name the name of Christ and call themselves members of the household of faith. You know, that is a word and that is a warning. And the warning is we have to always be on guard for ourselves, for our churches, for our ministries, for our institutions that we do not succumb to becoming a person or an institution that becomes a tool in the hands of the enemy that is used to literally bring about hurt and pain in the lives of others. Why, why is it that so many professing Christian churches and professing Christian entities and institutions too often as they are in the midst of attempting to fulfill their mission end up destroying the spirits and the souls of those who work within them. The testimonies of those who oftentimes have worked in supposedly Christian ministries, Christian environments, Christian institutions is devastating. It's as if we find at times more guidance for how to treat fellow believers from Sun Tzu's art of war than we do from the pages of Holy Scripture. And nothing can be more anathema to the spirit of Christ. If anything, our institutions, our ministries, our churches must model ways that we are able to be builders of the soul, not destroyers of the soul. Places where there is real hope and healing for the hurts. There's gonna be pain and suffering when you follow God in the ministry, oftentimes from within. 
I grieve at so much of what I see happening in our Southern Baptist Convention today, where equally devoted, Bible-believing, conservative brothers and sisters continue to want to find ways not just to disagree, but to seemingly destroy one another. The people will say things on social media they would never have the courage to say to somebody else's face. And I'll just lovingly encourage you, if you wouldn't be able to look somebody else in the eye and say that to them, don't even think about tweeting it or putting it on Facebook, putting it on Instagram, because it does not bear the credibility of Christ. And at times when you're tempted to criticize another brother or sister who may not agree on every finer point, every non-essential matter, find something to praise about that brother or sister first before you express that point of divergence or disagreement. Because remember, that person not only is a fellow image bearer, that person is somebody with whom we are together in a mission that is far more urgent, far more critical, far more needed today, given everything we see happening around us. We simply don't have time to devour ourselves. When there is a watching world that desperately needs the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is looking to see, is there anybody out there who really cares where we can genuinely find a people who are committed to the kind of New Testament Christianity, to the kind of, of Jesus-centered approach that I keep reading about if I open the Bible, but I just don't see enough of it actually being lived out, even from those who claim to be Christ's followers. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, verse 19. If you will return, I will take you back. You will stand in my presence. And if you speak noble words rather than worthless ones, you will be my spokesman. It is they who must return to you. You must not return to them. Then I will make you a fortified wall of bronze to this people. They will fight against you but will not overcome you. For I am with you. Is there any greater promise than that? Is there any greater affirmation than that? Is there any greater encouragement than that? Even in the midst of his pain, God's presence is just as real, just as certain. It may not always be able to be felt in the hurt, but it doesn't mean God is any less there or any less cares. right in the midst of the pain and suffering is his presence. And not just is his presence, but is the promise of victory, right? I am with you to save you and rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will rescue you from the power of evil people and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. See, the call when people want to fight dirty is not to fight dirtier. The, the call when people want to go low is not to go lower. The, the call is to stay faithful. To realize it's the Lord who fights the battles. It's the Lord who takes vengeance. It's the Lord who will settle all the scores. My responsibility is not to try to get even or even to get right, but it is to be right in my walk, my ministry, my commitment, my role. That, that's what matters most. At, at the end of the day, there are gonna be all kind of voices out there trying to tell you what kind of ministry you should have how you should choose to engage, how you should choose to do what you do. There are gonna be those who will be seeking to 
promise you all kinds of earthly powers and prestige and promise if you'll just kind of follow their agenda, their will, their plan, their way. But oftentimes they'll even encourage you. It's okay to step on somebody else as you're climbing to the top. It's okay to use people to further your agenda. That's okay because we can always baptize that in a veneer of spirituality that can sound so alluring but is so ult ultimately satanic in nature. Always ask yourself the question, whose voice am I listening to? Is it the crowd? Is it the alluring voice of the evil one? Or is it the voice of the one who fights our battles, who judges our hearts, who does what is right, even when it hurts? Who sent his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, to die as a sacrifice and an atonement for sinners. A death that hurt. A death of excruciating pain. Not just the physical torment, but the weight of bearing the sin of the world, our sin, your sin, my sin, on him. And in every moment where he had the chance to fight back, he was fully surrendered to the Father's plan knowing that the Lord was with him and that he was the Lord. Particularly between now and over the next few months, as we're in a very interesting time in the Southern Baptist Convention, my prayer is that God will use you, the men and women who make up the community of faith called the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Scarborough College, to be instruments of hope and healing of unity, rather than those who are stirrers up of strife, sowers of discord, division, dissension, those who ultimately become tools in the hands of the enemy, not in the hands of our Lord. Are we perfect? No. We'll fail. But we continue to press on, to strive to be found faithful. Particularly in a moment where I believe our convention of churches desperately needs men and women who will model. We stand firmly upon the truths we confess, the Baptist faith and message, the high view of scripture. We're committed to our great commission work together and to cooperation realizing we can't do it alone. But we do these things drawn out of a heartbeat of gratitude for the fact that of all the people in the universe that God could have chosen to live out your calling, he chose you. He chose you. Not because of you, but that his glory and his grace and his gospel might be made known in and through you. And so as we begin a new semester together here at Southwestern Seminary in Scarborough College, let us recommit ourselves together to coming together. In fact, the Latin word from which we derive our English term convocation literally means a coming together. If there's ever a time for the Southwestern Seminary family, for the Southern Baptist Convention to come together, it is now. May the Lord find us faithful and make us fruitful for his kingdom service. Even when it hurts, may we remember there is always his hope. May I invite you to stand as we sing the seminary hymn in response to the message that we've just heard. Lead on, O King Eternal.
all of God's people said? Yeah. Would you please remain standing for our benediction? And at the end of the benediction, if you would mind, remain in your places while the faculty recesses. Thank you so much. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You're dismissed. <laughs>